I'd like to welcome everybody to an event that we've been looking forward to for a number of months now. We are here to honor Tom Loth, the founding dean of the School of Public and International Affairs and a dear friend to many. Uh, we've been looking forward to this because we knew we'd be in a community of folks who feel the same way. And we have a wonderful set of panelists and a moderator uh, who know Tom really well. And I'm very briefly going to get out of the way, but I would just say that I uh, first met Tom uh, about 12 years ago. And I cannot think of anyone in my life who represents two things in one person more prominently than Tom Love, and that's uh, dignity and decency, that combination. Uh, when I first met Tom in his office, which is now my office, um, I thought to myself, this is like the first 15 seconds or so, I was like, wow, he, this is a very formal man. <laughs> and then within about 60 seconds, I, I thought, wow, this is a very kind man. That combination of uh, just his dignity and his decency, uh, I just can't think of anyone else in my life who, who embodied that uh, more strongly than Tom. And I think maybe we'll hear other people's impressions about him as a mentor, as a professor, uh, his stature in the field. And so with that, I'm going to ask John Maltese, who's the associate dean and university professor at the School of Public and International Affairs and professor of political science, uh, to come to the, to the uh, top here and, and uh, introduce our, our speakers. Or maybe the speakers will introduce themselves, but I'll let you okay. take the stage. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm so incredibly honored to be here with such distinguished uh, company, both the folks here on the panel with me and also all of you. We really appreciate you coming out today to uh, share uh, this time together to honor the life and legacy of Tom Loth, uh, someone who is a dear friend to, to all of us. Uh, before I introduce the panelists and open up the discussion to them, I just wanted to set the stage a little bit. Uh, Tom was born in Pittsburgh in April of 1938 to uh, uh, Mary Loth and Thomas Patrick Loth Sr. He was an only child. His father ran a hardware store. And Tom was always very, very proud of his blue collar roots. And he told me more than once that whenever possible, he preferred to wear a blue dress shirt rather than a white <laughs> dress shirt in honor of, of, of those roots. And so I'm wearing a blue shirt today in honor, of, uh, in honor of Tom. And I'm wearing a tie from Keeble College, which is one of the colleges that makes up the University of Oxford. Uh, when Tom first became dean, one of the first things that he did was to create a study abroad program at Oxford. And Keeble is the college that we're affiliated with there. And I know that's a very special place for, for Jeannie and for Tom. Uh, after Tom retired, he taught there twice. Uh, and I hope we'll have a chance to say just a bit more about that later. Uh, Tom and Jeannie have been partners practically for life. Uh, they, uh, uh, their parents knew each other before either of them was born. They both went to the same grammar school. Tom, I gather, was a year older, and at that age, a year's difference is a pretty big chasm, so they didn't get to know each other quite so well uh, when they were in grammar school. Uh, Tom was the valedictorian of his high school class and went off to Notre Dame, and uh, Jeannie went off to uh, the College of St. Mary of the Woods and uh, was looking for some dates and uh, uh, dated a couple guys from Notre Dame that turned out not to be all that fun. Uh, and she remembered this guy, Tom Loth, and uh, she decided that she would, uh, would talk to him, would go to him, not to see if he would take her out, but if he had advice for uh, some other people who might be uh, good, uh, good dates. So uh, when they were both back home in Pittsburgh uh, at church, 
she, uh, I guess Tom thought you cornered him, but uh, uh, she waited at the door for Tom to, to come out and uh, she explained the situation and said she was looking for a nice young man uh, to go on a date with and one thing led to another and well, you probably know Tom ended up being the one that took uh, Jeannie out <laughs> on, on, on the date. Uh, Jeannie said it was uh, love at first sight, practically, that they fell in love on that first date and uh, uh, married young, uh, had their first of four sons when Tom was still in graduate school at uh, the Maxwell School in Syracuse. Uh, they had a son before they owned a car, uh, <laughs> which made things a little bit interesting. And uh, the rest is history, I guess. You know, they had a 60-year marriage. And I thought, the last thing I'll do, I don't want to dominate the stage, but uh, the last thing I thought that I would do is say just uh, 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 read a passage from the acknowledgments of Tom's <laughs> last book. This was a book that he wrote uh, during the, or completed at least, during the COVID shut down, and uh, this is what he wrote about Jeannie. Throughout my career, and for most of my life, Jeannie McGregor Loff has been my partner and best friend. She read every draft of every chapter of this book, trying mightily to ensure that I adhered to the rules of grammar, punctuation, and syntax that we both learned many years ago at St. Philip grade school in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Of course, she bears no responsibility for my occasional failure to implement her recommendations. <laughs> I am grateful for her love, support, and encouragement. Her friendship made sheltering in place fun. Uh, so uh, that's, I'm sure Jeannie, Jeannie was an integral part of Tom's life, and I know she'll come up some more in the course of this, uh, of this panel. So we have, uh, Three other people who knew Tom very well. Uh, we have Catherine Willoughby, who uh, is uh, on the faculty now at uh, in the Department of Public uh, uh, Public Administration and Policy. Uh, she was a student of Tom's years ago, and uh, we had uh, for forty years. I was even saying. Felt bad we even say years ago. I shouldn't have <laughs> recently, very recently, yeah, studied with, with, with Tom Law. Uh, um, and I'll turn to her in just a second. Uh, we have Carolyn Bordeaux, uh, who is uh, both an academic and a policymaker, uh, served as a member of Congress, and is uh, very much involved in budgetary issues and, and knew Tom in that capacity. And uh, Danny Canso, who uh, was one of Tom's last students, uh, did, uh, took uh, uh, courses, uh, sort of tutorials, I guess, with him uh, during the, the pandemic. So let's start by talking a little bit about Tom's legacy as an academic. Uh, as I mentioned, he was a smart guy, graduated as valedictorian, uh, earned a BA from Notre Dame, earned a PhD from uh, Syracuse and went on to have a very successful career. Uh, Catherine, you recently wrote a tribute to Tom and talked about um, uh, his impact as a scholar. Maybe you could, sure. could share yeah. some of that with us. And just of note, I would not be here without Tom, so we can get into that a little bit later. But um, Tom is recognized as an exceptional scholar. And in that piece, we know that his depth of focus, his Oh. There it is. Is that better? Yeah. That's better. Depth of focus, his uh, strongly qualitative work where he talked directly to people and with people was very important. Gathering conversations and stories about uh, the work in the public sector. He also was highly prescient in his work, both with his research as well as his students. And by that, I mean his first article in the 70s was on zero-based budgeting um, that Jimmy Carter took to the federal government 
um, kind of. And then <laughs> it came back up in uh, 2012 in Georgia itself. So he um, spent time writing on things that were vitally important at the time, but also exceptionally important even today. His book on Voting Rights Act that he wrote with um, Howard Ball and Dale Crane uh, spoke to uh, the efforts of a certain political party to move polling places the night before an election in Mississippi. And the end result of that was that Charles Evers, who was head of the NAACP at the time, uh, lost to uh, Thad Cochran, who ended up serving in uh, con US Congress for 40 years. So highly uh, interesting uh, book on issues related to voting rights um, and social justice that we're talking about today. Five of his articles that were published in journals were reprinted nine times in multiple texts understood as classics in the field. Um, he co-authored with a number of people, Glenn Abney uh, among others, and multiple times he uh, published with senior scholars, junior scholars, his students, um, including me, and uh, had long collaborations with uh, his um, co-authors. And uh, according to Phil Joyce, who's one of my contemporaries, who was a, a, a student of uh, Tom's, he, he, he co-authored breathtakingly thorough examinations of state and local administration, as well as uh, public budgeting generally and in the state of Georgia. And this was through his uh, surveys of uh, state and local administrators uh, across years, and then also his conversations and interviews with folks um, across decades. He had two readers uh, on state budgeting that he wrote with Ed Clinch, and those covered um, over a dozen states in each one, written by himself and Ed, and then multiple uh, senior scholars in the field. His acknowledgments in the book that John noted um, for his last book speak to how many people uh, Tom knew and kept in touch with over 40 years. And that uh, in that book, he cites uh, August Turnbull's 1967 dissertation on Georgia budgeting, along with governors, uh, state budget office directors, legislators, um, students, and other professors. It was, it's a pretty amazing um, acknowledgement. I would say as a mentor, uh, Tom was prescient as well. He recognized in you what you may not see in yourself and could guide you to a, a really productive, successful future. He directed 32 dissertations. Um, 14 were US students and 18 were international students. And he empowered his students through his um, generosity in extending to you his relationships and his networks. Um, because of him, I conducted a 10-state study of budget analysts, and he put me in touch with every one of those 10 state budget directors personally that allowed me to go visit each and collect the data that I needed. Um, he stayed in touch with his students. When um, we looked at, went to his office to help get, gather materials for the archives here, um, his letters of recommendation for his students and those he knew is a who's who for the Association for Budgeting and Financial Management. I can't tell you how many people said to me, um, could you get my file for me, <laughs> Catherine? <laughs> I do want to end with saying that Tom, I don't know if people understand how gritty, how he had true grit. Tom went to Syracuse. They had they're a baby, and then maybe more, and then two, <laughs> and then before getting his degree, he went to Hofstra for a number of years to teach and be an administrator and work. 
And then he went back to Syracuse after those years and uh, completed his dissertation, which is a phenomenal thing. I mean, today in the newspaper you'll read, you think it's hard to go to college, well go to college with a child. And Tom went and got his PhD with four boys and his wife. So that's pretty amazing to me. So I would say Tom had true grit. He was extremely disciplined, so thoughtful and caring, highly generous. Um, and I would end with fun. He was a lot of fun. And I would add to that, uh, he was an elected fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration. Uh, he won the Aaron Wildowski Award for a Lifetime Scholarly Achievement in Public Budgeting. And uh, uh, I have a little bit of a taste. I've been in administration now for 12 years, and it has an impact on your research. Tom was in a much more stressful position as dean. And uh, I noted that during, that during the 12 years he served as dean, he published 10 articles, four book chapters, and one edited book, which mm -hmm. I think is a pretty darn good record uh, for while you're we serving as, uh, as a dean. And then, mm -hmm. uh, as you mentioned, he finished up his last book after he retired. Uh, Carolyn, you, you come from a background both in academics and in sort of in public policy. Uh, so you've yeah. seen Tom, in a sense, from both sides. Yeah. I wonder if you could say just a little bit about his sure. impact on, uh, in, in, in that regard. Yeah. So um, I've often thought that I should, you know, when we put up our web page of our lives or something, we should have a page dedicated to the great mentors that we've had. And Tom... Catherine, you would also be on that. I want you to know. <laughs> I first hired her to Georgia State. I was head of that committee. But, yeah. <laughs> but, but Tom was, was absolutely on there. And he, uh, I, I knew him as a junior scholar. Mm -hmm. Catherine was also mentoring me, but directing me to Tom as somebody else uh, who really knew the field so well, had such, ma such mastery of it. Uh, when I started out, he was already sort of one of the, the, the leading scholars in public finance with a focus on state budgeting. Um, and he was a wonderful mentor through that time. Uh, I was not working directly under him as others were, but he was the kind of person, and uh, this could be a lesson to all of us, you know, when you gave him your paper to review or to comment on, he read it all the way through, right? And he would give you those comments back, and he would encourage you, you know, in a, a way that was both thorough, because he read it, he would critique it, but also that you know, here's how you shape it and make it stronger, and you've got good ideas, that kind of reassurance uh, in that process. Of course, then I went on and I was director of the Senate Budget and Evaluation Office, and that was where I got to appreciate him in a whole new way, uh, and that was between 2007 to 2010, so that was during the Great Recession. And um, Tom had written some, uh, a very important piece uh, around zero-based budgeting. And uh, I had read that, and as we were confronting the, um, the Great uh, Recession and this plunge in revenues of 20% 20, 20 plunge, um, people would come to me and go, oh, we need to do zero-based budgeting, which is what he'd written on, right? And so he was somebody who was often an advisor to myself. I was working under Jack Hill, who was uh, the chairman of appropriations at that time. And, uh, and, and Jack loved talking to Tom. And I was a bit concerned because Tom was working on an update, of course, of, of this fantastic book that I have and I keep on my shelf and uh, have autographed from Tom. And uh, I, I was concerned, for instance, when uh, Jack was going to be talking with Tom Loth. And I thought that he, as a politician, might be worried about telling, sharing stories with Tom and that you know, this might be published and might reflect negatively on him. But Jack was so excited to talk uh, with Tom and so loved those conversations because there was this back and forth. And you know, Jack could talk to somebody who had worked around on this budget uh, for decades and had seen how it had evolved and had seen the challenges, many other challenging times that the state had gone through and was able to share ideas and understand sort of how to approach uh, 
you know, how that we were going to make these, these tough cuts and tough decisions. Um, of course, uh, you had asked me to some degree to speak about how he spoke truth to power. And in his zero-based budgeting research, uh, which was one of the first publications that he did back in like 1978, it was his first one, um, and it was absolutely excellent. And it was looking at Jimmy Carter's effort to do zero-based budgeting. And at the end, I think I wrote it down, uh, he concludes that, uh, those who expected zero-based budgeting to result in widespread program elimination and or substantial cost reductions have been disappointed. <laughs> the effects of ZBB have been much more moderate and subtle. And then he goes on about how incremental budgeting, which, would, which was what ZBB was meant to fix, uh, really has persisted in the same way, which is that budgeters, you know, they take the prior year budget, they adjust around the edges. So here he is, you know, telling a... Uh, the executive branch that, you know, this might not be working so well, right? And he did the same thing again, uh, really was what Governor Deal uh, went out there and proposed zero-based budgeting. And, uh, you know, again, you know, Tom was there behind the scenes talking to people like Jack Hill and other people who are working on the budget and pointing out that zero-based budgeting, it doesn't mean you go down to zero, actually. And then start up from there, but you, you know, how you, act, how this actually, this reform actually works. Um, so I think those were. He, he brought to the field excellence in the practice of what he did, and he brought to the field courage, and that combination. And I think in this time when academia is very challenged in terms of the research and the blowback and all of that, particularly in the policy world. Um, he really stands as a model for how to ask the impertinent, impertinent but important question, and that that requires courage, how to do the research that goes out and talks to people in the field, that collects data, but also is deeply grounded in people's real experience of how they're experiencing that policy. That requires insight and courage, and then when he published, it showed so much integrity, he was, would say it in a way that was kind, courageous, but also said things that corrected and would stand up to people who were in power and who might not want to hear what he had to say. Thank you. Uh, Catherine mentioned before going through Tom's office, and one of the things that we discovered as we were going through his office were uh, written surveys, responses from pretty much all 50 governors yeah. on the line item veto. He had all his survey data there. Right. Yeah. And you quoted uh, Phil Joyce before. I have one other quote from Phil Joyce. Uh, he said, Tom was deeply committed to doing research that makes a difference. He was not satisfied to research issues that are only of interest to other academics, but rather has always done research that crosses the line between the world of academia and the world of politics. Uh, and I think that helped to make him a, an outstanding founding dean of the School of Public and International Affairs. I should also add, before I turn things over to Danny, uh, for over 20 years, he convened annual sessions of the State Appropriations and Budgeting, which was part of the Biennial Institute of the, uh, uh, for Georgia Legislators uh, at UGA's Carlinson. Uh, so, Danny, uh, you had the honor of co-authoring with, with, with Tom. You were also, as I said before, uh, probably his last student. So maybe you could tell us a little bit what it was like working with Tom in that capacity and how he brought his research into the classroom setting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and it's such an honor to, to share the stage with, with you all and to think about uh, just all of the people that Tom impacted. And certainly for me, uh, I really credit Tom with at the points where I was, you know, it, it, in, in my earliest sort of at the University of Georgia and, and when I was uncertain uh, after, after working for Casey Cagle and, and, and his campaign for Governor didn't work out of what I would do next. Uh, someone who provided so much encouragement and guidance that, that, that truly, you know, I, I wouldn't be, any, any, any aspect of my life would not be what it is today. Uh, without without him, um, and, and I was very fortunate because when I was a freshman, 
somehow I was able to take Tom's uh, public finance class as a freshman at the University of Georgia in my spring semester. And it was the first major class that I had taken. So I was, and it was the last class that he taught before he retired at his dean. So I really came in at, at the last minute to meet him. But it was so engaging and so transformative to me. And every, every, you know, Tuesday and Thursday, I would look forward to going to that class, and I just couldn't absorb it enough. So I, you know, kind of worked up the courage to, to ask for a meeting and, and went into the dean's office. Uh, and and I, I told him, you know, I'm in my freshman year here. Uh, I, I, I love this class. I love, you know, what I'm learning here. Um, you know, I, I, I haven't felt this way before. You know, what's some advice that you'd give me for, for, for how I can, you know, use my time at Georgia? And he, he told me two things that I did and, and that, uh, you know, have, have taken me, uh, you know, the, the, that I credit with you know, being the highlights of my academic journey um, outside of working with Tom. Um, and, and the first was to study at Oxford. Um, and he helped me get a scholarship so that I could go the following semester. Um, and the second was to take Dr. Bullock's Southern Politics class, uh, which I did that fall. Uh, and then Dr. Bullock became a mentor to me uh, and has continued to work with me over the last decade. Um, and then, you know, I kept up with Tom as an undergrad and, and, and went to work for Casey Cagle after graduating and get some experience in the field. Uh, and then, you know, we had a couple of conversations during that where I would ask him for advice. And he was very honest and very direct, particularly as we went into some of the elements of the campaign. Uh, and, you know, gave me a way to, to think about things. I mean, as a young person, who is inclined academically and politically, and then ultimately when that didn't work out, he was sort of a, a guiding push to enroll in the PhD program at the University of Georgia and give us, you know, study both American politics and public policy. And he offered to kind of continue being a mentor to me and helping me do that. Uh, you know, so much so that when the pandemic hit, uh, we had planned to do a an independent study course, and, and, and that ended up being Zoom sessions uh, where we would meet every week for kind of hours on end for 12 weeks. Um, it, it, you know, we later reflected with Jimmy, uh, and it was funny, you know, to, to talk about where he would sit in the dining room, and I think she heard a lot of our a lot of our intense conversations. But literally, you know, we spent 12 weeks, and he was, you know, uh, unyieldingly generous with his time. I mean, he would just talk as long as we want. No question was off limits. He was so thoughtful and introspective about both his work, you know, what he would do differently. We read through everything from the Turnbull dissertation to, you know, Catherine's work to his work. And, and he, through that, he gave me my first publication, which was us writing about the state's response to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. It was published in the Municipal Finance Journal. And then, you know, after that, I was having a little bit of trouble because I wanted to do both American politics and public policy. And, and you know, sometimes that can be challenging with just the course load that you have to take and the way that you can qualify with that with the system. But Tom, you know, <laughs> was willing to vouch for me and actually to the point where he agreed with the department that he would teach me another independent study that would be my preparation to take comps for public policy. Um, and, you know, we worked through, he, at the time he was working on the book that, uh, <laughs> that, that, that Carolyn uh, has here, which I stand by as truly one of the greatest books on Georgia uh, politics and policy that's ever been published. I mean, something that is so amazing and rich because of the conversations that he had with governors from Carl, Stan Carl Sanders forward, you know, countless legislators. Uh, and, and, and so he, he was just so willing to give himself, so generous, you know, such a powerful mentor all the way through. I mean, we were doing these classes, you know, 2020, 2021, um, and, and I'll just never forget, you know, how, how much he prioritized the importance of the human element. You know, that you cannot just, even when we're talking about the budget, when we're talking about things that do lend themselves to numbers and you know, their quantitative elements that you have to talk to people. You know, you cannot lose the human story and the human thread. And actually, that is the way that you can break through to you know both ends of public policy, both measuring and the substance of what we're doing and how it affects people's lives. Um, and, and so, 
Yeah, I, I just feel you know so fortunate uh, to, to have had those experiences and to you know ha have had that time uh, and 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 just you know it, un until the very end he was thinking and writing and contributing and you know pouring into people um, and you know I, I, I'll, I'll always carry that with me. I don't think you were at Oxford when Tom was there, right? No, no. but uh, Tom. Of all the people, well, with all due respect, I know there are several of you in this room who've, who've been on-site faculty members at Oxford, but Tom and Jeannie really did an extraordinary job, I thought, of getting to know all of the students. They would have them over for dinner in pairs, uh, and, and over the course of the term at Oxford, uh, had all of them for dinner, had a number of reunions at their house. I, and a couple of them, so Tom really kept up with the students that he worked with, wrote letters of recommendation for many of them, was always available for lunch and for, for coffees. And it was that sort of genuine interest that he had in people that I think helped to make him such a great mentor. I mean, you, you, you support with him, and I, I think oh, you yeah. can yeah. attest to I that. I mean, I was, I was at ASPA this week, and I was on a panel, and. Um, and a, a doctoral student stood up. It was an editorial panel. Um, and a doctoral student stood up and said, um, you know, well, I, I'm just, I'm trying to get published and I'm trying to get my data together and I'm trying to make connections and, and, and uh, generate a network. And, and uh, she said, I just, I don't, you know, how are we supposed to do it all? And I said, well, if you're not being successful, Blame your major professor because your major professor is the one who should be, you know, in your court doing these things for you, helping you make connections with the networks you need, those you need. Um, connecting with, um, you know, data and funding, you know, helping you get some funding so you can conduct the work you need. And, and I said, that's what Tom did for me. That's what my major professor did for me um, 40 years ago and that's what I hope I do for my own students and she said well my major professor is sitting right beside you <laughs> and I said well he didn't get mad <laughs> so yeah he's in your court very much in your court um, no, I, I obviously never took a class with Tom but I, I sort of took a class in how to be an administrator and how to lead through Tom. I first met him as a very naive, young, I had just turned 27, and I came through and gave a job talk here at the University of Georgia, and I think did a pretty awful job. Uh, <laughs> and somehow I was still hired, and you were stuck with me since, since then. But uh, Tom was a mentor at virtually every stage of my career, helping me uh, get tenure, be promoted, uh, guiding me when I became department head and as associate dean, and was s still very much a mentor, really right up until the, the end, although what made it special for me was we also got to be friends along the way and sort of uh, became, uh, I never thought of ourselves as equals, but I felt on a little bit closer plane to Tom than I did when I was that 27-year-old kid coming through uh, through Georgia. Um, talked about some verbs or w words that you think of with Tom: fairness, integrity, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. neat, neat, <laughs> uh, very neat. Jeannie said the only time that she paused a little bit and thought, "What am I getting myself into?" was the first time she opened. Tom's sock drawer and saw how incredibly neat and organized it was. <laughs> uh, um, one of my memories of Tom, uh, very early on, there was, well, I think the first departmental party that I went to was, we had a, what was called a pig party, where we roasted a pig in the backyard. It was the backyard of Hal Rainey's. And uh, I was hopelessly overdressed. And ever, even Tom, you know, who tended to be formal, uh, by his standards, he was informal that day. He had a pullover, very iron press pullover. <laughs> but, you know, he was 
he was he was casual. <laughs> but even he was just giving me a hard time, John. You've got to loosen up. You've got to. You know, you know. So uh, a few months later, there was an invitation to a party at Tom and Jeannie's house, and I thought, okay, you know, I've learned my lesson. <laughs> and so uh, I wear shorts and uh, and sandals and wear a violent fans t-shirt. I knock on the door, the door swings open, Tom is perfectly attired, everybody inside is wearing a coat and tie. <laughs> Tom looks at me, sort of straightens his tie and you know, folds his, uh, his shirt <laughs> sleeves a little bit, looks me up and down. Uh, I think there was probably a little bit of a smile there, but I, I, I was too mortified to, to, to think about it. And he uh, gestured to the gentleman standing next to him, who was also very well attired, and he said, John, this is John Kozak, the Dean of Arts and Sciences. <laughs> and I said, hello. <laughs> and stayed as short a time as I possibly could at that party. So I, Ever since then, I've been hopeless, hopelessly overdressed to every occasion that I that, that, that I went to. Um, but he yeah. but he did have a little flair. I mean, I remember this last year when he went b before that was published, and he he had everything on a little tiny thumb drive that was a mandolin and a little mandolin, and so he took me into his office and he goes, you know, sissy, because he called me sissy, he said, sissy, if anything happens, it's all here. And I, was like, I was like, oh, it's not a Georgia thumb drive, it's a little mandolin. It's from Korea. Oh, from Korea, yeah. So. Okay. I would say one other thing is that, you know, his, uh, his engagement with human beings, you know, just his enjoyment of people and talking to them. And I don't know how you found it, Danny, when you did research with him. But one of the things I loved about his research was that he, you know, he'd go out and he'd talk to the budget directors. And he would, um, and in some budgeting, particularly in state budgeting, it's very hard to get just sort of a big data set, you know, and do the two stage least squares, fancy, you know, mathematical modeling and things like that. You have to really talk to people to understand the nuance of how the money is moving uh, in the state budgets. And so, and I don't know if you all are familiar with his work on the line item veto, which mm -hmm. is just fantastic. Mm -hmm. And what was happening, this was in the mid 80s, everybody was thinking of the line item veto as this way of enforcing fiscal responsibility. And so you're going to give the executive, the governor, the president, uh, line item veto authority, and presto, change the budgets would be balanced, right? And so he goes and he sits there and he really talks to people and he teases out what actually is going on with the line item veto with these choices. And he finds, which should have been no surprise to anybody, that it's being used to enforce executive power, right? And the executive is using it to, you know, line item veto out things that he does not like and to punish people who have caused him trouble in the legislature and things like that. But it's much more, it's being used strategically not to balance the budget. Which in retrospect was perfectly obvious, right? <laughs> that is how it would be used. But I think, you know, taking the friendliness and the, the, the joy in life and the engagement with, with people and bringing that really into the research really was what made his contribution so, so important. And the threat of the veto. Yes, or the threat the as well. The threat yeah. of the veto yeah. could sway policy before it was made. Right. So, you know, it's those nuances. Yeah, that you, yeah, that you would never yeah. have seen yeah. Yeah. otherwise. Yeah. yeah no, Tom really loved people, loved talking to people, and uh, uh, I think that's part of what made him not only a great mentor but a great founding dean of mm -hmm. our school. That he really was a conciliator and someone who was extraordinarily fair and even-handed in all the years that I knew him. I knew him about 35 years. Uh, I never knew him to renege on any promise that he had mm -hmm. made. Uh, he treated everybody with respect. Um, he really cared on a personal level for everybody, uh, uh, from uh, uh, staff and custodians to, uh, to faculty. One of the most memorable things for me uh, 
as uh, I was not yet tenured at that point, still a very junior uh, faculty member, my mother died, and uh, Tom showed up at the funeral uh, in Alabama, which was about a three hour drive each way for him. Uh, and that was a gesture that just really meant a lot to me. You know, I didn't expect him to come. He hadn't told me he was going to come, but he did. You know, and that's sort of what Tom did. Uh, he showed up for that. Uh, he, along with some other folks here, uh, I remember went to the wedding of uh, uh, the daughter of Clifford Moore, who was a wonderful custodian in our uh, Baldwin Hall years ago. Uh, so he really cared about mm -hmm. people, and uh, uh, you, you felt that. And I think that sort of helped to make us uh, a family that cared about each other and uh, uh, our collective success. Yeah, yeah. Well, one interesting element that, that I want to ask him about, you know, he, he did this very unique research where he was such an authority on worship mm -hmm. and such an authority in charting out this genre of you know, state, public finance, fiscal policy, uh, and, and you know, these seminal pieces of research that still hold up. Mm -hmm. I mean, I sent some of his work to a student last week uh, you know, to, to read and apply to a term paper that they're working on at Emory you know, right now. Uh, but, but in addition to that, he also mentored 18 international students. Mm -hmm. I remember you know, we read through these different dissertations, mm -hmm. and I said, once you it, you mentored more international students than you know, domestic students. You know, why, why was that? You know, how did that kind of work? And, and he loved to travel. He was so curious and just such a good person that, that was, those relationships resonated across so many boundaries. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, he was able to build these relationships with people that might not have anything in common aside from their friendship with Tom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, I, I think that, that was just always so, uh, just a powerful statement of who he was. You know, he was able to see inside of somebody, regardless of you know, what you might present on the surface, um, and, and, and carry that through and just put so much you know, individual effort into you and into getting to know you, um, and just w was so well trapped. Yeah, and staying so. in contact. He stayed in contact with everybody. Um, and, I, and as I said earlier, his relationships with state officials, I'm convinced that his relationships with budget uh, officers and legislators and governors over really 50 years um, was the reason that Georgia has the triple, triple credit rating. I would say that, yeah. He was consistent in providing, um, you know, truth to power, as you would say. So, and he stayed in touch with all his students. Very much so. Uh, well, I hope you, I mean, you, you all certainly know Tom, some of you extremely well. Uh, for those of you who maybe didn't know him as well, I hope that this has helped to give sort of a sense of of who Tom was and the impact that he had on so many of us. Uh, when I became department head, he gave me uh, something called the uh, Tom's 10 Touchstones. Uh, and I thought this might be an appropriate way to sort of bring the panel to a conclusion. Sort of sum, summed up his uh, views on leadership. Uh, talking here specifically about being a department head, but it applies equally, I think, to any other sort of administrative post. Uh, he says, first, keep the departmental mission in focus. Believe in the mission and use it as a basis for your decisions. Second, be uh, consult with folks in your department, but don't waste their time. You know, don't overly consult, I guess. Um, uh, facilitate faculty professional development, which he certainly did uh, in, in many, many ways. Be consistent and fair in implementing departmental policies. I can't imagine anybody who was more fair than, than Tom. Uh, be consistent and fair in implementing departmental policies and procedures and apply, in, in applying rules and regulations that apply to faculty, students, and staff, and be open and honest in conducting departmental affairs. 
lead by example, uh, strive for excellence in teaching and research, be informed about the university, the college, departmental policies and procedures, uh, faculty members and students are entitled to accurate and reliable information, you should provide it. Assemble a competent and reliable administrative team, delegate clearly defined responsibilities, support their decisions, uh, except in extreme instances of malfeasance, and be sure that they receive recognition for their contributions to departmental accomplishments. And I guess one thing we didn't haven't talked about is the real loyalty that Tom uh, instilled not only in faculty but among staff. When I joined the faculty uh, in 1989, his administrative assistants were uh, Pam Smith and Nancy Thompson. And when I retired, uh, his administrative assistants were Pam Smith and uh, Nancy uh, Power. That, you know, there aren't a lot of instances where staff stays with somebody for over 30 years the way they did with, uh, with Tom. Uh, it says make timely decisions based upon the best information available and then move ahead. Uh, worry about future decisions, they are the only ones you can influence. Learn from mistakes but don't dwell on them. Remember that in a system of faculty governance, department heads depend upon the consent of the governed. And finally, and I think we've touched on this in many of the things that we've been saying, Maintain a sense of humor and don't take yourself too seriously. Um, so that's that. Those were Tom's ten touchstones, and they really say a lot about who he was. I think as a, as a person and a leader and mentor and a, and a friend. So uh, I know that all of you have many stories that you would love to share, and I encourage you to do that in the reception that follows. Uh, we will have a reception out in the atrium, sh share stories with each other, uh, with Jeannie and Tom's sons, and uh, thank all of you for coming today. <laughs>